Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to paint this sweet little blue bird. And I don't think it's actually a blue bird per se, but it's a bird that's blue and I don't really know the actual name of it. Uh, we're gonna paint them with the new Jane Davenport watercolors. Of course, you can use whatever watercolors you have. I will give you, um, I, because I took the labels off and I just have my homemade swatches, I'm going to give you the colors kind of as we are used to hearing them called um, in artist colors. I do have a review on this on my YouTube channel and on my blog if you want to check it out. And our friend Rich the Spin Doctor did put an um, analysis of the pigments used on his website as well. So if you go to my blog, you can find all those links and all that information. Uh, the reference photo is also... Um, linked in the video description from I and I want to thank um, the folks that told me about this site Pixabay that has a copyright free public domain images it was very nice to have some photo, different photos to work from so and you don't need to sign up or be a member to see that which is also kind of um, helpful I think for those of you having a hard time getting into paint my photo uh, so we're gonna begin by sketching I'm just gonna move my little swatches over to the side and um, what we're going to do is start with some basic shapes. I am working right on my watercolor paper because this is not a very difficult sketch. Um, draw lighter than I am, though, because I'm just going to draw dark to make sure you can see them. My studio lights are kind of bright, and sometimes it can wash out um, a sketch on white paper because it is just overcompensating for the white. So I'm going to start off with the, the shape for the body, which is kind of... Um, how, how do I describe it? It's kind of just like a... It's kind of like an egg shaped, but it's not perfectly oval. I'm going to, oh yeah, I guess you can see that pretty well. I'm looking at my monitor. It seems like that's showing up all right. And then I'm going to put up this kind of blocky circle for the head. I'm going to need a little bit more of a, um, of an angle there for the wing. It kind of reminds me of, like this, this shape here. Do you guys remember the Muppets and that eagle guy, um, the grumpy eagle? I don't know what his, what his name was. Was it Earl the Eagle or something? The Grumpy Eagle. That's what that shape reminds me of. So we're drawing our Grumpy Eagle. Hopefully this bird, this bird does look a little grumpy though. Look at his face. <laughs> he's totally bothered. He does not, he's not impressed. He's like, he's up early. He's like, why am I up this early? Why am I being painted? What is life? I don't know. Uh, okay, we're going to put some little feet. This bird is sitting on a stump. And I wouldn't get too fussy with the feet. I mean, honestly, they're just going to be little lines and splashes. Well, we're going to take it easy. It is, it is 10 o'clock in the morning. It's earlier for a lot of you guys. Get the shape of the stump in there. In case you want to not have a bird just floating midair. We're going to get our little beak in there. And I mean, as much you can put as much detail as you want. I'll go ahead and draw a little more detail because I think um, sometimes that makes you feel a little more confident if you know where your paint's gonna go. Um, but you do what is more comfortable for you. I'm gonna the beak kind of starts back there. You got that little bit of uh, almost like feathery stuff that that grows over the beak a little bit. We could give it. We could upturn his beak a little bit so at least he looks like he's smiling a little bit. So grumpy. Grumpy, grumpy old bird. Okay, and I think I, that's about it. I guess I will put these little, just this little division here for color, in case we want a little help there. We got some division in color. We're going to do some mixing. Now, what I like to do at this point, oh good, I have my eraser. My son had asked me if I had an eraser he could borrow, and I sat on my work table, then I didn't, I didn't uh, check back to see if it got returned. Oh, lucky me, or we would have some extra lines. Seriously, if that's the worst thing of my day, I'm not going to complain too hard. All right, so I've um, taken out any of my extra lines. If you um, if you have any dampness on your hands, it's a good idea to use a brush to uh, brush off the crumbs. That way you don't smudge your um, pencil too much. And I'm just using a uh, Pentel HB uh, pencil. It's a uh, 0.7 millimeter lead. It's a smudgy pencil, but I like a smudgy pencil, so... Um, so I like it. I'm going to scoot just over a bit because I want you to see my paint. I think it's more important for you to see me mix than it is for you to see. I might even be able to keep that little guy on the corner there. Let's see if we can get this all. I think we might be able to get this all in the shot. Hey, look at that. It's early, but I'm I'm on the ball. Okay, so I got my brights here. 
I got my neutrals here. What you're going to notice about these paints is that the neutral, the uh, the brights, all have cool undertones. They are very transparent, so it's difficult to make mud with this set. Great for floral painters. Um, you can mix skin tones with this, but it is a little more difficult. And I, I went through all of this on my review, but I just wanted to kind of reiterate uh, very briefly before we begin. Uh, the neutrals all have warm undertones. Our red, yellow, blue are all warm base, meaning they make a fantastic orange. Greens and purples are going to be more muted and plummy. Um, so just kind of give you that idea. And the reason I tell you that is because I know we're all drooling about the mermaid markers. Um, I <laughs> I know, I was so bad. I bought quite a few different things. Um, so if you wanted the mermaid markers and you're like, well, I can get the markers and I can get one set of paints. What should I get? Get the neutrals because you can use them all together and uh, that would give you a nice range. Um, cause these are brights, those are brights, you know, you get a lot of versatility that way, I think. Um, or just be a bonehead like me and buy it all cause you want it. I mean, <laughs> oh, who are we kidding? Right. I also recommend you have a bucket of water or actually two buckets of water or one bucket that's divided like my nasty old water bucket is that works really well. And a couple round brushes, um, use whatever size is comfortable for you. I personally like a pointed number eight round and then I grabbed the small one. Um, I can actually get the detail with a number eight, but it holds so much water and paint that when I'm getting in there to do the eye and whatnot, I end up flooding my paper because it's just too much. And I like this number two. These are my favorites. I'm my most useful from the uh, Mimic Squirrel. They're Faux Squirrel from Jerry's Artorama. I find the eight and the two rounds are perfect. They are actually in a value pack with some other brushes that are nice too. But if you had to pick two, that's those are pretty good. And I think they have a BOGO going on right now. Somebody told me. I haven't looked because seriously, I have been living high on the art supply hog lately and I need to take a break. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, look at some of our colors. Um, we're going to be using some of this color here. This is kind of like a nice uh, burnt sienna looking color. It's PR 101, which is what you recognize from burnt sienna, Indian red, English red, Venetian, uh, well, sometimes Venetian red, sometimes that's brighter, but it's kind of like a rusty color. See, it's kind of pretty. We're going to also grab some ultramarine blue. Um, I apologize for not remembering what the Jane Davenport names are, but this is an ultramarine blue, same pigment. And the reason I like these together is because they'll give you a nice um, uh, gray together. It does want to tip a little purple, but uh, but it's not bad. But see, you get a really lovely gray that way, and we will be using that. Uh, we're also going to use some phthalo blue. And again, I apologize that I don't know, I can't remember the Jane name, but it's this one right here. Isn't that pretty? And I think we're going to use a lot of different colors kind of straight from the pots, but I just wanted to kind of get those right out because those are those are our primary ones we're going to use. So what I want to do first is wet the bird. I'm going to do a little wet and wet painting. And actually, we're going to wet everything except for the wing at this point and the feet. We just want to get the, uh, get like the head and the chest, get that... Uh, worked out. Oh, and if you do have questions before the end of the broadcast, um, Val can help you out with those. So can our other moderators. They are on the ball. Um, so if you have something right away, they probably know the answer. They This is not their first rodeo. They've done a lot of my streams. So they they uh, know a lot of my answers if it's something that, uh, that we've talked about before. Now, I like to do a wash, an all over wash, because it helps unify the piece. Um, I am, I'm not doing the eye just because I, um, I know I'm going to need that area to be drier in a little bit. And that will help me kind of uh, keep track of it if it gets a little, br a little bright. I'm going to take that gray that we mixed, that, we've used, that we used the ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna. And I am going to go ahead and add some of that on the chest here. Uh, the nice thing about these colors, they're both uh, mineral based. They are, they're heavier which means they're not going to flow as much. And you'll see when I grab the phthalo blue what I mean about that. So these minerally colors, they're going to they're gonna sit, they're going to settle, they're going to separate. They look at what's going on. They're, that's what's going to give us this little fluffy that, and texture that's so beautiful with watercolors. So knowing what colors do that, and we've talked a lot about granulating colors, and I know it sometimes confuses folks, but, um, but learning how your paints behave can not only give you the color you want when you mix it, but give you the visual texture that you need to. I'm just getting that gray anywhere I see it, but I'm letting the paint. I'm letting the paint do the work. I'm not working here. The paint is doing the work. Uh, a little bit more there. So now I'm going to go ahead and grab some of the phthalo. This color right here. I'm impressed with how strong these colors are. I'm just going to add a little in there and see what it does. You can tip your paper if you need to. 
That seems a little too strong to me, though. So what I'm going to do is actually grab um, the lighter color. It's kind of like um, a cobalt teal. This one I remember is called 70s Eyeshadow because that's such a fun name. I had no problem remembering that. I'm going to add some of that here. Now, the paper I used for my sample was um, a student paper by Daler Rowney called Aquafine. It was in my Cache watercolor sketchbook. So, And this is a Strathmore greeting card, which is a Strathmore 400 series. So they may not give me exactly the same results, but I think it'll be pretty close. They're both cellulose papers. They're not very expensive. And you can alter how much of each color you're putting in. I like to drag out just a little bit of fine, fine hairs. Drag, drag, drag. I'm going to throw a little bit down here. Oh, and I can see the beautiful granulation happening already uh, in the chest. It just gives it that, that soft texture. I also want some um, kind of golden colors. I'm going to be using the um, this uh, it's kind of like a yellow ochre here. See that? When I spread it out, I think it's easier for you to see when I spread it out there. I'll take a little bit of that, and we're going to add that in and around the face. We're going to add it under the beak. Now you're thinking, oh boy, that's getting a little green there. What are you going to do, Lindsay? Well, this, uh, this PR101 is a pigment red, but it looks very brown, but it's actually a red. I can go in and I can add that in here, and that's going to kind of neutralize that green because they're opposites on the color wheel. And I can go in and add that any place I want to warm things up. And also, I want to tell you, this color right here and that ultramarine where we mixed our gray, those are very liftable colors. So it makes it um, very easy if, like, we decide we need a highlight or we want to change something, we can do that very, very uh, handily with those colors. Just let the colors do their thing. Now, I am going to bring this color over here because I know I need some of that. So I might as well do it while it's on my brush rather than rinse it away and waste it. So that's going right in here. And I'm just blocking it in. As long as I don't have any puddles here, I shouldn't get any weird blooms. I'm kind of hoping I get some interesting blooms around here, though, because it gives me that pretty uh, texture that I want. I do want a little bit more of that gray, so I'm mixing up that uh, red on my, that, um, I think it might be called light red on the, I don't remember. It's the brown from the, um, the warmer brown from the neutral set. And I am going in, I am going to make a nice dark, you could actually use the pre-made indigo if you prefer, but I am going to just mix up a nice dark there. And I'm going to add that in under the wing to give it a little bit of shadow. Maybe I'll add a little phthalo blue into that since I have been using that. Then I'll darken it up a little bit too. A little more red. That's a little... There we go. That's that's a little better. And then I can go in and add that. And those pigments are going to... That's kind of going to kind of fight the water there. And it's going to give me that ruffly look that I got right in here in my um, in my example. And I really like the way that looked. I really wanted to be able to um, get that to happen again. And I can go in later and add more um, add more shadows, but I like to do as much as I can in this initial wash just because it, it saves time, and I think it looks a little more natural. And I know this is a very liftable color with those with those uh, that red reddish brown color. So I can go in and add a few shadows uh, here and there. If I need to lift them out later, then I'm not going to. Uh, not gonna let it bother me. We're all still working with this big brush. Um, now I think I'm going to rinse off that color. I'm going to grab the uh, 70s eyeshadow, which is kind of like a cobalt teal. And I am going to add that onto the wing. So that's it on its own. It's very, um, very pretty. It's a semi-transparent color. It's not as clear as the phthalo blue, which is extremely transparent. I'm going to leave a little valley of white because if I don't, it's going to whoosh into, my, into the body and give me some blooms where I don't want them. So I am leaving a very, very scant, um, scant 
barrier of paper, of dry paper, because the paint's only going to go where the paper's wet. So if you remember that, that's going to be your best friend of knowledge there. The paper goes where it's wet. Now, I also want a little bit of ultramarine blue in here. So I'm going to go right ahead, grab that off the palette. I'm not adding more water to my brush. I, I want the color. I don't want to soak my brush in water because that's going to make it flow more than I want. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this and add that, leaving that little scant border still. Add this right up here. And then I think I'm going to grab a little bit. I'm just going to kind of wipe off my brush stand, grab a little bit of this uh, phthalo. And that is a wetter paint because I just picked it off, off my palette off of a juicy bead of color. I'm going to add that in there. That's going to be a transition color. And look at it flow. So now that color is going to gently flow down. It's not super wet, so it's going to it's going to travel slowly. I can go in, and you can see it's still flowing. I can go in if I'm worried about um, blooms, and I can put a dry brush. So if I dry my brush off really good, I got my paper towel here. I dry it off. And a tip, a uh, frugal tip for paper towels. Um, if you eat a lot of vegetables, which we eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, um, you know when you wash off like an apple and you dry it off to, you know, pack in your kid's lunch or, or have for a snack. Um, save that paper towel for your watercolor. So that's what I do. I always like, I'll, I'll wipe off an apple, wash off an apple and I'll throw the paper towel at the end of the counter. And then my husband's like, he's like, uh, it's safe to throw this away. Right. And I'm like, no, that's, that's my paint and paper towel. <laughs> so I take it over to the, I, so I take it to the craft room. So you would keep like a little, I don't know, tissue box, empty tissue box or something to tuck your, uh, your paper towels that have just been used for vegetables in if you want that uh that works pretty well and uh and i always have plenty of paper towels and i don't feel like i'm wasting i always feel kind of like i don't know i always feel but i don't want to wash off an apple with a hand towel because i don't know for some reason that seems like well it could get icky on it and then i'm putting icky on my apple i don't know it just for some reason this seems to be a just fantastic idea for me i'm going to grab a little more of that yellow ochre and i'm going to paint the feet And I kind of drew them, drew this one a little big. I think I'm just gonna ignore what I drew and just kind of paint some some toes there. Remember, when you're painting, especially watercolor, if you're doing a loose watercolor, your brain is gonna fill in the details of uh, of any missing lines. Um, so there's no need to be fussy about it. So I know this one's foot back here is going to be a little shaded. So I just wiped all that gunk. Look at that gunk off my pat my pan. Um, so I'm going to use that gunk to my advantage. I'm going to make this nice shadowy leg back here while I'm at it. Didn't even waste the gunk. It probably may, it makes very little difference, but I figure that it probably in the long run, it probably like will save me. I don't know. Some, a few rolls of paper towels and a few pans of paint. I don't know. I was thinking about that. I always uh, pay in cash when I go to gas in my vehicle because they give you a five cent a gallon discount. And I'm like, yeah, I say like 70 cents a, a fill up. It's not huge. But I figure over time, that probably adds up. Now, right here, I got this weird uh, hard edge happening. And what I'm going to do is see if I can soften it with a soft brush. I might need to go grab a uh, stiffer brush for this. But um, I oh, look, it's softening just fine because we use colors that want to mix. So if you do get a weird hard line, you don't like it, we'll just go brush over it after it's dry. If you do it while it's damp, though, you're going to force a bloom there because um, uh, because you're going to be at, you're going to be pushing that water into paint that is not dry yet. So it's it's going to uh, look. I might be able to force a little bloom here where I want that fluff. We will see. I don't know because like that area is still a little bit wet. I might be able to do that with something fluffy like this. It's um, it's totally fine. And I feel like I want the fur to come down a little bit more, fluff to come down a little bit around this foot closer to me. So I'm actually going to redo this little section here. There we go. There we go, make his fluff come down a little bit further. Okay. I love to see how, how the paints change as you're working with them. And if I want to soften that edge, so I'm just going in with a damp brush and softening that. All right, so now I have a choice to make. I can either mix more black from colors that I've used, or I can use black right from the pan because that is provided. Um, if you are familiar with my tutorials, you probably know what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go ahead and mix my black. So I've got this, uh, this mix I've been using. 
and because the uh, that light red there is not as dark as the um, the burnt sienna I typically use, I'm gonna sneak a little phthalo blue in there. And the reason I'm gonna do this is because transparent colors generally will make darker darks than opaque colors. And that um, ultramarine blue is a, is more opaque than phthalo blue. It's just the nature of the beast. The pigment particles are larger, and that's that's how it rolls. So if I add the phthalo blue in there, I'm going to get a darker color because it's more transparent and more intense. So I'm going to see what I can get with those colors and see if I can get the shade that I want. We don't have a lot of colors going on in here. So um, like we don't have a true red. Our red is pretty much that burnt sienna. Um, so we're going to see how it looks. If it doesn't look natural and I feel like I need to either add a red or add a black, I'll do that. But um, if I don't, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to stick it to what I've already stick to what I've already been doing and what I've already been, already been using. I think that's kind of a mistake that a lot of beginners make is that they um, it's not wrong to use any of your colors. First of all, let me say that if you like to use white, you like to use gray, you like to use purple. It doesn't matter. There's no bad colors. There's no colors that you absolutely shouldn't use. The taboo of using white and black, I think, are, are pretty much gone. But I think the problem that a lot of beginners have is using too many colors in one painting, and then everything becomes um, confused and discordant. So you know, maybe say, okay, I'm going to use like I'm going to use these four colors in this painting. And I'm going to use a different four colors in another painting. So it's not like you have to waste all those other colors. Just don't use them all at once in one painting is what I'm, what I'm getting at. Now, when I'm confused about whether my, um, my picture is dry or not, because I don't want to layer something over if my painting's dry, I touch it with the back of my hand. If it feels room temperature, it's, it's dry. If it feels cool to the touch at all, then it's still wet. So I don't want to go on top of that and paint anything else yet. So I think I'll work on this stump. And I think I'll give this guy a little bit of a shadow. Since I have this dark on my brush already, I'm just going to go ahead and put some shadows under the feet. Now I'm going to rinse my brush and grab some of that uh, beautiful brown, this uh, what I would call burnt sienna, kind of, or golden, or um, red ochre. It's, it's a PR 101. It's a nice, it's a nice brown. I'm going to go in that some of that to the shadow area. I'm also going to throw some in down the edge. I'm going to grab that yellow ochre. So we're using colors we've already used. Grab this color here. It's all been stuff from the neutrals except for those two blues. We used three blues though. Isn't that funny? And I'm gonna leave some white because white is our is our bright sunlight. White of the paper. Now don't fret. If you if you do a, we're gonna use some gel pen in this. So don't worry if you like lose your whites and you're like, oh no, what am I gonna do? Don't worry. We'll use some gel pen in a little bit to bring those like a sparkle in the eye. So you don't have to, you know, this is a stress-free painting. Now, a trick that I like to do for doing texture is I'll have a couple different texture tricks. One trick I like to do when the paper's really wet, and um, hopefully my credit card scraper is somewhere on this horribly, horribly messy desk that I have going on right here. Oh, you know what, guys? I think I might have to improvise. Uh, so what I will do <laughs> is I will grab this brush that has a beveled edge, um, and I'm just going to go ahead and scratch some... Uh, some wood grain here while this is still wet. Now with a beveled scraper edge, something you might not realize is that if you use it on its, sometimes you can get a, push the pigment away and get a lighter line. I don't know if it'll do it on, yeah, sometimes if I, if I scrape it just right, I'll get a lighter line. I think it's when it's drier. If I scrape it when it's drier, I get a lighter line. If I scrape it while it's wet, I get a darker line. So it's one of those lovely little surprises. <laughs> what am I going to get? <laughs> Sometimes you time it perfectly, other times not so much. Um, but I usually cut a piece of a credit card and I use that to scrape. But um, this desk was a serious mess. I probably should have uh, given myself a little more time to prepare for the live stream. But I was excited to share. All right, we're going to let that dry before we do any more details because we did kind of lose the feet there, but not to worry. All right, I'm going to hit that with a heat gun just for a sec, just because I don't want my, uh, my paint to feather. Feather on the feathers. And that's also something that can happen when you go to paint wet next to a damp area. You'll just get a, a very a jagged, feathery line. Kind of like um, when you put on lipstick without lip liner. All right. So now we are going to use that same dark mix. I just want enough water on my brush so it will flow. 
Okay, that's it. I do not want to have a ton of water here. Okay, I'm using a brush with short bristles, not a liner brush, because I don't want to have a ton of water here. So what I'm going to do is get the little eyeball in. And I'm going to get this line here. I try to keep my hand out of the way. Multitasking, folks. And I think I'm going to leave just a little bit of white on the top. Then I think I'm going to go in with um, oh, that golden color in a second when that's dry. But while we're waiting for that to dry, we can go uh, fuss with the beak a little bit. Generally, we'd have a little bit more shadow on that bottom beak. And there we go. Okay, now we can start putting a few details in. So I've got this dark color still. I know I need a kind of a dark shadow. I'm going to try not to set my hand in that uh, area of my painting. So I've got a little bit of dark shadow here where the wing meets the body going to pull that out. Grab a, that same mix, but it's got a little bit more of the uh, brown in it. I'm just going to flick up just some uh, suggestions of the feather. We're not painting. We're painting suggestions here. Our brain is going to fill in the rest. Now, I did want to brighten that color for a little bit, too. And notice I'm going to the small brush. I'm, I'm still using that small brush because as I work on a painting, um, I start big and I go small because I'm way less worried uh, as I move throughout the painting so I can fuss with a little brush. If you start fussing with a little brush off the get-go, you're going to be, um, I think, a little inhibited as you work. If you start off with your big brush, you're not going to worry so much because, you know, you're at the beginning of a painting. As you progress on, um, move to your smaller brushes. There's less damage you can do with a small brush, but you've gotten most of the work done already. So that's where it's kind of helpful. And again, I'm doing little suggestions of feathers, just little dabs. Feel free to use any of the colors we've already used, but try not to go after a new color at the stage of the game or it's going to look a little discordant. I want to brighten up the colors back here on the back of the head. Now, this technique called the British two brush technique that I just, uh, I've actually used it before. I didn't know what it was called. Uh, so I'm going to show you that. So sometimes you're painting and you're you're trying to, you know, just adjust something and you just need a little bit of color here, but you don't want this weird hard edge. So what they do, what you do is you have two brushes going. You have one brush for painting and one brush that is clean and damp for blending. And then you just go along that edge that you want to uh, soften and blend it out. That's called the British two brush technique. I don't know why it's British, but only some, some British artists must have invented it. Oops, that brush is a little wet there. Well, as your colors dry, they shift lighter. And so then you need to go in and adjust sometimes. Just make sure you keep that second brush that you're blending with dry. I need a little bit more yellow, golden color in the face. So I'm going to go ahead and grab some of that. Thanks again to our wonderful moderators keeping the chat going. Um, and just a reminder, I will take your questions at the end of the broadcast. So just keep them handy and ask me then. I, I probably won't be able to fish back through the chat. So if you, if you have them ready for me, that would be super Awesome and helpful. I'm going to sneak that right up to the eye. Grab a little bit of that brown to avoid the green. Hopefully my hand's not in the way. The eyes impart so much character and personality. Try to make these strokes count, okay? Try not to over fuss and just try to make your, your brush strokes count here. For little slivers of white, don't worry about it. We got a gel pen. 
I like to say we're not making fine art, we're making fun art, guys. Nobody has to see this if you don't want if you don't want them to when you're done. It's yours. You decide. Okay, we're gonna go in with some more of those blues. I got the mix of 70s eyeshadow and the Thalo blue, which I that's what kind of what you would use what the typical name would be called. Um And I'm just doing little flicks, suggesting feathers. This paint has quite a bit of water in it. I know it's going to dry lighter, so um, so I'm not going to worry if if it looks a little bold now. I'm I'm not going to let that bother me because I know it's going to fade out a little bit as it dries because of the amount of water I have. When you're painting with a drier brush and thicker paint, you're not going to notice as much shift. But when you have it watered down from your palette, even though it looks looks pretty bright when you're going on, it is going to shift later. And I think I'm not sure about the angle of those little feathers, so I'm just going to soften them with my dry brush. I mean, my clean brush. It's not that dry, actually. Um, okay, I do think I kind of want to go back with really watered down grayish paint and get a little bit of shadow here it's a little bit looser I feel like that's a little too restricted fatten up my bird a little bit with the shadow so I'm gonna clean the brush and just kind of soften some of the edges Okay, I want to do a little lifting, and the brush I prefer for lifting is called a Maxine's Mop, and hopefully, yeah, it's right here. And this is a quarter-inch Maxine's Mop, and I've been using it for years and years and years, so it's nice, and it's just the perfect softness. It's not too stiff, it's not too soft, it just makes lifting ever so easy. And I'm going to lift a highlight off of the shoulder there. Now, if you want more, blot it. Never rub. I see watercolorists rub their paper, and maybe they have some super duper like strong paper. But um, I find blotting works works better, and it never damages my paper, even if I'm using cheap paper. Well, like lighten that up a little bit. And I think I'll also lighten up a smidgen on top of the beak. Here. Now I'm almost feeling like that shoulder should be up a little higher. I'm gonna do a little uh, a little editing here of this. This I feel like that needs to be up a little higher, just ever so slightly. You can leave it because it doesn't it's not that big of a deal i just thought for me it just seemed like that was just a little too a little too um flat and let's see i think i want a little bit of a, a little darker line between these two colors and then um, now where is your drive there's any place you want to go in and add a little more shadow you can like if you want to get under the swing a little bit with a little shadow you don't have to if it's dry you don't have to keep that um, that barrier although sometimes the sparkle looks nice so don't feel like you have to get rid of it if you like it going in and get a little shadow under that wing And I'm, and I'm forcing a bloom. I'm going to try to. I'm putting in a lot of water right here because I want to get that fuzzy edge roughly bloom there that I had before. I'm hoping that this paper will, will uh, let me replicate that. Okay, and then I'm going to do a ultramarine blue and thalo blue mix here and just get some of these darker uh, feathers. And maybe gray it up a little bit. Get 
give it some expressive strokes. I like I like expressive strokes. You don't have to do this. If we come a little bit more back here too, that's a little a little light for me actually. And I am dripping in a little water here and there just because I like the way it looks. If you don't like that loose of a painting, don't do it. You don't have to. A little more uh, burnt sienna up there on its own. I'm going to let it like kind of flow in. I like the darker colors I had in my other painting. And then we'll do a little bit of yellow ochre in there. Oops, if you do get a water drop, uh, that's kind of unfortunate. I'm just going to blot it up really quick. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go work on the uh, stump a little bit while that's drying. We're just about done here. As soon as it's dry, we'll just put our white gel pen highlights. Um, and I'm just going to take a little yellow ochre and a little bit of that um, reddish color. And I'm just going to add some, like, little uh, textures. Ooh, you know what? This would be a really great opportunity to play with your fan brush. If you have, like, a hog fan brush, the kind that you would um, use for oil painting, oh, this is a good, good opportunity to use it because you can get some really cool uh, textures. Just grab whatever dirty paint you have on your palette. The only thing you have to worry about is that you don't make it look too samey. So I wouldn't do the whole thing. Maybe do a little, a few brushes down with that and then go back into your small brush with your small brush and get like other details. But uh, it's really a quick way to add some texture. It's kind of fun. And a little, a little hog brush like that's not very expensive either. The only brushes I found that's really, uh, are bad with watercolor. There's some fabric brushes. I might even have one right here. These fabric brushes with the super, super stiff nylon bristles, those will chew up your paper. Even good papers, they just chew it. So um, it's almost like using a wire brush on them. They're so abrasive. Uh, that would be about the only one I would avoid. And sometimes they look they look like a um, like an oil painting brush and you think, oh, that's what I want, a stiff brush. But those will chew your paper and you'll get them and you think, oh my gosh, I must have really horrible paper if this is like chewing through but it's it's just those brushes are really rough on them so great for fabric though that's what they're meant for they're meant for pushing like acrylic and fabric paints onto uh onto fabric but they're too rough for your watercolor paper okay i'm going to brighten up the feet just a smidgen because they are they did get a little dull there uh taking the yellow ochre and we will use a little bit of gel pen on those all right, and I kind of want to try just like a little bit of a yellow ochre wash. Let me go in with my bigger brush. I feel like I just want a little bit of that yellow ochre. Kind of sunning it up a little bit. Just splashy and loose. Actually, no. You don't have to do this, but I like to. I can add a few little splashes of uh, paint if you want. You do need quite a bit of uh, water on your brush to get it to splash. Try not to get my camera when I do that. Be brave with a little bit more of the brighter blue. There. And you will get some, if you have some damp paper that I got into, like I did right there, it gives you a cool bloom. I'm going to leave it because I like it. Okay, so I'm going to dry this and we're going to go in with our question. We're going to go with, we're gonna go with our gel pen, then we're going to have our questions. I love seeing the chat. You guys are really, uh, oh my gosh, there's almost 300 people. Holy cow. Thanks for sharing. You guys must have shared that. I do appreciate that. <laughs> I'd love a thumbs up before you go too, if, you, uh, if you're if you so inclined, if you enjoyed this tutorial. That's great because it helps other people find me. And sharing is caring. We can all uh, we can all share the watercolor love. Because I love my watercolors. Okay, so gel pen. This is my favorite gel pen. This is a Uniball Signo, 
and um, I like it because it doesn't seem to clog and I seem to be able to use the whole pen up. There's so many pens that gel pens that they just seem to dry up or like the ball gets frozen in place or something and I and there's ink in there and I can't use them. But one tip I'll give you is not to buy in bulk. If you do buy in bulk, use one, use it up before you open your next one because that's what keeps gel pens working well. Um, this is by the Mitsubishi Paper, uh, Pencil Company. Um, but it's called the Uniball Signo. So a lot of people ask me what I use. I highly recommend it. Um, so what I'm going to do is my bright highlights here. These are the this is the cherry on top. It's the icing on the cake. We do not want to overdo it. Uh, but if you do overdo it, and I say that because I overdo it quite frequently. Um, if you do overdo it, don't worry because you can glaze over with watercolors uh, once it's dry. It's it's quite a forgiving thing. I'm just putting in a few little indications of my fur. So if you think of the fur kind of coming out, um, it's going around the contour of the body. So it's kind of like um, lines on a pumpkin or seeds on a strawberry. So just be sure when you put your little indication that you are going with the direction of the body, okay? And I just put that out there because my, my dark line is pretty much gone. So that's just going to help me get that definition. I'm try to keep my hand out of the way. If your paper is wet, your your pen will want to skip. So, if you find it doing that, it's probably why. You probably just need to let it dry. Just think any place you'd have a glossy uh, reflection. That's a great place to put your little highlights. It really takes a lot of the kind of fear and stress away about like saving your whites. Especially if you just want to have fun splash of paint around and you're not exactly sure what you're what you're like going for yet. And then I'm doing squiggly lines on the toes rather than straight lines because I want that kind of rough texture. I'm just kind of wiggling it. And I'm only doing the highlights on the bird. You could do it on the stump if you want, but I really want the attention to be on the bird. So uh, so that's why I'm doing that. And I'm gonna even give it a little bit of a highlight up there. But there you have it. Pretty darn easy, fun, relaxed. You could probably paint it faster. I like to uh, like to go slow when I'm doing a live. That way, um, you have a chance to paint along. And if you do have questions, then as they come to you, you can uh, you can ask me. So I'm gonna look in the uh, in the chat right now and take any questions that you have. This is the end of the tutorial portion. So if that's all you're here for, then I uh, thank you for watching. Um, okay, Ian says, I wonder if a gua. Oh shoot, he went by. Oh, I hate it when I lose the uh, <laughs> when I lose a question. Um, Ian says, "I wonder if a gouache watery mix dip pen might be a nice way to do this." Yeah, I think so. And um, you could either dip a pen, or you could um, you could load it into one of those um, pens that hold the ink. Uh, do you hit a wet brush? against a finger or your hand. Uh, you can do anything. You can either whack it across your hand, your finger, or you can just kind of kind of flick it. Um, Jen wants to give her turners a second chance. Oh yeah, this will work great with the turners. It'll work good with whatever watercolors you have. If you have any questions about the specific brand, you can ask me as well, but you can use whatever you want. Um, what's your advice for teaching new student watercolors? Um, I would pick a project that is uh, like a high success rate, like maybe masking tape birch trees or something like that. That you know they're going to get a very, very a predictable result, and start that way because um, they'll pick up the techniques you need them to learn as you go. Uh... Danielle is wondering. Oh, has a question for Jay. She's wondering what she didn't like about Turner. Oh, I like the Turner paints. Uh, Ian's asking, would I do a brush out painting? Oh, that's a good idea. I should grab my I have brush out, color burst, and the magenta mad, uh, magenta powders. I should I should get those up. Um, I gotta put it on my request page, Ian, or send me an email because I won't remember. Uh, Grace wonders, what's the light fastness for the Jane Davenport watercolors? Uh, they range between one and three. Um, I would say they're probably fair to good. The, some colors, I mean, like the, the PR101 is a good color. Uh, PB29 is very uh, stable color. Uh, most of the earth tones are very stable. Um, light fast colors bright ones you get a little um hit or miss just because bright colors tend to be less light fast uh there is information on her website janedamport.com if you click on the watercolors the petite palettes you can find all that information um let's see yes jen they're very transparent especially the brights and even the um 
even the neutrals were quite transparent, even the skin tones. There are a lot of convenience mixes in the neutrals for skin tones, though, um, because they are geared, I think, to a artist. Oh, Heather would also like to see a brush show project. Okay. And so would Gracie. All right. Uh, thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. She said it's a beautiful bird. Um, Lee is wondering if I've tried the Shinhan PWC paints. I haven't tried any Shinhan paints. I've noticed there's two, and they both say they're artists. One is like artists, and one is premium, and there's a huge price difference. So, um, no, I haven't yet. They're kind of hanging out in my Amazon cart to see if they like go on a really good sale, but I haven't bit the bullet yet. Uh, what are some of the examples of the high success rate projects that you mentioned? Okay, um, Anna, if you, like, I have a couple tutorials doing birch trees with masking tape. That's a high success project. Um, sunsets with a silhouette in front of them, like any of my three color sunsets, that's a high success project. Um, it's a simple uh, project that um, you f do A, B, and C, and you will get D. Those are those, are those type of projects. But generally, like the sunsets with the silhouettes and the masking tape, Tape birch trees for watercolors, I would say, are high success projects. Uh, let's see. Crafty One Cent asks, what watercolors do I like best? That's like asking to pick a favorite child. I don't know. There's so many good ones, and I have to consider price. Um, so, like, it's not fair to me to say a set of 12 watercolors that cost $120, you know, compared to a set of 12 watercolors that cost $30. I mean, that's, I don't know. My favorites, I would say probably M. Graham, if, uh, you know, putting no uh, other stipulations on it, I would say M. Graham. I like them. I like, I like a lot of paints. I have a lot of paints. <laughs> I have a whole review playlist if you're curious, if you want more individual. Um, do the paints move around in the tins, Grace Wonders? Watch this, though. Any paints will move around unless you put them in properly. So when you get your paints, you take them out and you unwrap them and your tins are kind of loose. What you want to do before you put them back in, you pinch it a little bit. Okay, not super a lot, but just a little bit. Then you put your pan in. I don't, I don't know if that's enough, maybe a little bit more. You want to put your pan in at an angle so you've got it against this rail. You've got the front corner against the rail. Then you pop it in, and that's going to snap it in place and keep it from moving around. You could put a little bit of um, uh, poster putty underneath if that doesn't do the trick, but that should do it. Question, I have a trouble getting a nice color pink for cherry blossoms. None of the colors I have work for themselves. Do you have any tips? Uh, for a cherry blossom, you probably want a really transparent pinkish color, such as a quinacridone pink um, or a permanent mauve. Any like PV19 color, look for that pigment. That's going to really help you because then you can add water to it or you can add a little bit of uh, blue to it to cool it down and shadow it. Um, and when you are coloring pink and red things, don't use the opposite to shade. Use like a blue or a violet or something because uh, something close to it on the color wheel will get a much more natural look. Um, question, why not use the white watercolor instead of the gel pen? Because this white is a mixing white. It's not very opaque, and a gel pen is extremely opaque. Uh Let's see. And if you do have a question, type the word question in all caps so I catch it. Sometimes the chat goes fast and I can't see it. And if I missed anybody's questions, I apologize. Um, you could put it in the comments and I'll answer you there after the video is done. I'm doing my best, but I but I probably will miss one or two and I do apologize. Uh, Lydia is asking how to make a good skin color with watercolors. Um, something that worked good for me when I just had the bright set, this has premixes, so you can just use what they have and add a little pink, add a little blue, add a little this, add a little that. But oh, if you have just the bright color, what I used was I went for opposites first. So I went with yellow and purple. Those are opposites. And then I added a little smidgen of that um, kind of more opaque blue. And then I had a little smidgen of pink if I needed to. So um, try to find two opposites. Purple and yellow are great because they're going to be low saturation, brownish. They're going to make a brownish color every time. And then just alter that after you go. And uh, of course, if you're making a darker skin tone, you're going to want more intense colors. If you're making a fair skin tone, you're going to need uh, lighter colors. Uh, this is the Uniball Signo gel, gel pen. Someone just asked. Um... What's the name of the mop? That is a Maxine's mop by Lowell Cornell, quarter inch. Perfect. It's like the most ideal lifting brush. Uh, recommendations on brush sets for beginners. Uh, you're near Michael's and Jerry's Artorama. Oh, Jer go to Jerry's, get the Mimic score. Well, no, you know what? Sorry. For beginners, I'm going to change my mind. Beginners, if you buy Jerry's, get the Ebony, Splen Ebony Splendor short handle set. If you're going to the big box store, get the Royal and Langnickel Aqualine or Majestic line. Um, Kitty Lover, 1958. I'm sorry. I don't know how to unstick gel pens. They 
dry and then I've tried boiling water I've tried rubbing in my hand I've tried a lighter I just just chuck them it's not honestly you will never get that time back I've learned the hard way on that one get a new pen unfortunately um, well, thanks for joining us, Olivia. I see your work shift is starting soon. I appreciate you coming by. The, the fan brush, that size is a, um, oh my, I don't know if I can read this. Number four, Royal um, 2825. Oh, I can't read that, but it's it's a number four. It's about, I'm going to, let me grab a ruler. I can measure it for you. It is about an inch across at the fan. And I know this is just like a $2 one from the craft store. Um, the reference photo is linked in the video description. Okay, question. I'm new to watercolors and purchased Artist Loft watercolors from a local craft store. They do not have color names. How do I know what to use when trying to follow along? I would just try to eyeball it, honestly. Um, that's probably the best way. Go download a, like a chart from um, like Daniel Smith or any of the big companies and then just look at your stand, your paint, swatch them out, try to mention them, and just write down the names that, that are traditional names. Um, Christian wonders, have you used Prang watercolors? Those are great watercolors. They're nice and transparent and super vivid. Great for the money. I recommend it for teaching children because they're so inexpensive, but they work great. Absolutely. Uh, for spattering colors, uh, excuse me, I just burped a little bit. I hope you enjoy that. Uh, <laughs> uh, for spattering colors, I used whatever I had dirty left in my palette. So yellow ochres, blue, green, blue, brown, blue, brown, yellow ochre, that sort of thing. Uh, I just, just flicked it on. And should have a video. Oh, somebody. Thank you, Valerie, for answering. <laughs> I didn't catch that question apparently. Um, again, the gel print pen brand, Luis. It is Uniball Signo. It's about four dollars worth every penny, but only buy one, use it up, then buy another one. I don't recommend buying gel pens in bulk um, to save money. Anywhere to sell, store the gel pens? You know what? I find if you just use them regularly, that keeps them working. Um, I downstairs I store them flat, but the upstairs I'm using it so often I just pop them in my jar with my other brushes and stuff while I'm not using it because I use them so often. I usually will put them tip down though. Um, I don't know if it really helps, <laughs> but I you know in my mind it helps I guess. Okay, uh, Heather, I do have a uh, Heather says she'd like a mixing tutorial with the Daniel Smith Essentials. I do have a uh, review on them and I do mix them in the review if you want to go check that out. You caught the live broadcast. We're going to wrap it up in just a couple minutes here. So get those last minute questions in if you have them. And I think you can actually keep the page open and chat with each other a little longer if you want to. But I will be stopping the broadcast in um, about a minute. So looking for any last minute questions. Okay, when refilling, my turner's got two of the blues mixed up. And I tried to scrape out all and scrub most of it out. But I'm sure there's some wrong color. Is it okay? I'm gonna tell, I wish I had my one of my teaching palettes here because I have a really... <laughs> crazy palette and I swear in some of my wells I've got like four colors in there uh, it's it shouldn't really make a big difference I wouldn't worry about it just keep painting you'll be through that offending color in no pro no time and you'll be fine but then yeah I have to show you my teaching palettes and I got some real crazy hybrids happening in that uh, that particular it was a secondhand palette and painted it when I got it so um, so it's interesting I know I missed a question by Ian I'm just gonna try to scooch back up and find that Thank you for your patience. You guys are all so awesome and patient with me while I'm uh, messing around here. Question, why, when I do watery paintings, when it comes to details like eyes I uh, that are strong, I find it hard to gel the two together. Any hints? Um, well, you need all the different values in a painting, and there, you probably are lacking some mid-tone values. So if you can go in with some just kind of watery paint that's not as watery as your first wash, it's not as strong as your last detail, and you just kind of um, go in and kind of dab some splashes on like we did here, just kind of dab on some, like this middle gray I put in here that I mixed with the blue and the, the red, the red-brown. Um, that will help you bridge the gap and make it not seem so stark. Or you could also just kind of blot your strong Highlight your strong colors before it dries, and then uh, then that will help it out. Okay, I hope I didn't miss any questions. I do appreciate you all for joining live. Thank you so much. Um, please hit that thumbs up before you go. I will make this video live for everyone shortly when I uh, after I cut out our secret special hangout that we do at the beginning because we're all so awesome. But I love to I love to treat the people well that come in live. That's uh, 
that's so much fun to do these impromptu live shows but i will have this um uh up published live for everybody shortly thank you to you everyone for coming over again these were the jan jane davenport watercolors i picked up at michael's um they retail for 30 bucks but you can use a coupon obviously and get them for much less i saw some people got them this weekend for like 13 bucks totally uh worth every penny in my opinion and i did have a lot of fun with them but you can use whatever you have to paint this thank you again so much for joining and um please hit the thumbs up before you go um happy crafting